Welcome back everyone for the final lecture of the semester. In this chapter we are going to examine some of the future possibilities for the criminal justice system and possible directions we may end up taking one day in regards to how we prosecute crime, police our citizens, and incarcerate our offenders. Let's begin by taking a look at the future of law enforcement. As we know from previous lectures and discussions regarding policing in the United States, it is an ever-evolving practice that is no stranger from controversy from time to time. But as we move forward, we have to question whether or not we will follow more of a crime control model or a due process model format. As you remember from Chapter 1, we are currently in a crime control phase in which the focus is placed on processing crimes and criminals rather than dealing with the ideals of rehabilitation and trying to stop the revolving door offenders. Realistically, the future of criminal justice will continue down the crime control pathway for the foreseeable future to come. Because we are following the crime control model, we will, we will see that the investigative abilities of the police should be improved and made easier by the expansion of community policing. More resource sources will be diverted to this area. But the downside of that, as we know, is that American citizens can expect greater intrusion into their lives, maybe even more so than we are already seeing. Privacy will be sacrificed for efficiency in crime control even though the continuous renewal of laws like the Patriot Act occur. Exemplified by recent controversies surrounding the NSA, we will see a greater intrusion into people's lives that will be facilitated by advances in electronic surveillance. Furthermore, we are seeing every move we make and every word we say being recorded for future incrimination. For me, that's a very troubling prospect, to say the least. If the United States should, sh should see a shift take place that moves away from the crime control model and moves toward the due process model, there will be some significant changes that occur. Instead of seeing more expansions on the police role in combating crime, we will see things uh, being tucked in a bit more. The idea of arrest without probable cause might be eliminated, as well as the 48-hour holding period that is currently present. The expansions we've seen on surveillance may also be curtailed, and the government wouldn't be able to keep cell phone records, internet search records, or any other type of data that is com being compiled from these covert style collections. And finally, the, DA the DNA testing issue would have to be addressed as well. We are currently collecting DNA samples to store in a massive database. The DNA database is comprised of samples that are taken only from book suspects and criminal justice personnel upon their hiring. That is the current practice with fingerprints as well. But if the crime control model prevails, the DNA database may comprise DNA samples that are taken shortly after birth from all infants in the United States and there would be no more need to have an arrest take place for law enforcement to have access to those samples. Similar concerns will accompany the collection of biometric data. With the due process model, some of these concerns, not all, but some, are alleviated. Given the current political climate in the United States and around the world, I personally do not foresee us moving towards the due process model anytime soon. We are currently seeing some advances occur that help to aid law enforcement and keep those individuals safe as they attempt to complete their jobs. Advancement in law enforcement technologies are inevitable and will continue to progress as, as we continue to have the resources available to make those advancements possible. One of the biggest items we have seen take place is the use of robot technology, which allows for the police to investigate potentially dangerous items without having to personally be in the blast zone if one of the devices should happen to be incendiary. Not all agencies have robot technologies, as it is still rather expensive, but the majority of larger departments do have them to serve some SWAT purposes. On a smaller scale, we have seen the use of digital surveillance in our cities and towns for the past few decades. Surveillance cameras are so widespread that we sometimes don't even acknowledge their presence anymore. These cameras are set up at traffic lights and street lights to determine whether or not you actually ran the red light. They 
they are able to look for specific cars whenever an amber or a silver alert is issued, and they simply provide routine surveillance for specific city blocks. Even more recently, we have seen an increase in the use of body cameras and dashboard cameras for police who are patrolling. With the recent increase in police-related incidents, whether they are fatal or non-fatal in nature, there has been a strong call for mandatory use of these cameras so that there is video evidence whenever these encounters occur. Some departments argue that they either do not need the cameras or that they cannot afford them. In response, the federal government will, has, will allocate $20 million for police departments to be able to purchase these cameras. This took place in two, May 2015 when the Obama administration began a grant-based pilot program in order to be able to allocate these cameras for police departments. This initial $20 million was the start of a three-year program in which $75 million would be budgeted overall to ensure that nearly all police departments would be able to obtain these body and dash cameras. Part of the pilot program that is being mandated by the Obama administration requires that the depart department measure the effectiveness of the body cameras and provide that data and information to the federal government in an effort to provide an evaluation of best practices regarding this issue. If the administration of justice in the United States is, in, is more in line with the crime control model, then the right to counsel at critical pretrial and post-trial stages may be scaled back significantly. The crime control model enthusiasts advocate for the abolition of the preliminary hearing as well, which they see as a waste of time and money. However, this is one of the most important aspects of the trial process, and despite the idea that it may slow down the trial process in terms of efficiency, without preliminary hearings, defendants may be lost in the system and their due process rights have the potential to be violated. Due process model advocates believe that the preliminary hearing is a critical stage in the administration of justice, perhaps giving a judicial officer the only chance to scrutinize the prosecutor's work. Due process model enthusiasts argue instead for the elimination of the grand jury, which they say has become a rubber stamp for prosecutors. It is not very difficult to receive the grand jury's recommendation to prosecute a defendant for the prosecutor's recommended crimes. No matter what, it is highly unlikely that the right to counsel will disappear for defendants overall. Over the years, strong efforts have been made and court cases won which validate and confirm a defendant's right to counsel. The rulings, of course, only provide for a public defender, and that comes with a variety of issues in, it, in and of itself. However, the right to counsel through various stages of the court process should not be abandoned anytime soon. One of the issues that we discussed in the last lecture was the difference between adult and juvenile defendants. We established the juvenile justice system in 1899 as a way to separate juveniles away from adult defendants and to account for the specific differences between those two groups. The crime control model does not allow for prolonged use of juvenile justice system. Instead, there would be an increased use of juvenile transfer, meaning that juvenile defendants would be transferred to and tried in adult courts. If there is a constantly increasing use of the adult court, juvenile courts may be eliminated altogether. This would lead to an even more bogged down justice system and would require that the correctional system take in even, even more inmates, which would only further exacerbate their overcrowding situation. On the other hand of the, or, uh, uh, sorry, on the other side of the argument rather, the due process proponents would also argue for the elimination of the juvenile justice system, but for different reasons. Juvenile defendants in the juvenile system do not have the same constitutional or procedural safeguards that adults have in the adult court. But by eliminating the juvenile system to account for these safeguards, we end up creating the same problems that would result from dissolution of the juvenile system for the crime control model's goals. In addition to advancements for rudimentary, rudimentary issues, we are also seeing the criminal justice system working to advance its preparations for what happens when there is a large-scale natural disaster or even a terrorist attack from either domestic or international sources. 
Events like the Oklahoma City bombing, Hurricane Katrina, and even 9-11 showed us that we are not prepared to deal with the aftermath of these events. The aftermath of the hurricanes like Katrina revealed the importance of electronic filing of court documents. When everything is flooded, important documentation is no longer available to us. By filing court documents electronically, backup files can more easily and more efficiently be sent to alternate sites for protection, thereby minimizing the disruption of the court business. The need for intranet data communication networks also became apparent. This allowed for different jurisdictions to be connected to one another and to allow for specific safeguards to be put in place to keep those networks secure. During emergencies, the network allows the courts to maintain essential functions by providing remote access via private broadband internet and dial-up services. Additional measures can be taken in order to make sure that, there are, that if there are disasters or threats of violence, that regular procedures can keep working. Even on a regular basis, items like interactive television do not require the transport of defendants to and from the courthouse for something as short as a first appearance. This not only saves money, but also time regarding how many defendants can be seen in one day. Additionally, it allows for potential witnesses to not have to see or confront their assailant, but still be able to testify in court. Eventually, we, will, we may have the ability to use neuroscience to detect whether or not defendants are lying in court, or even if they are guilty or not guilty. Insanity pleas would be easier to prove as well. However, we are a long way off from the use of neuroscience becoming the norm and used routinely. Finally, let's end the lecture with a short discussion of advancements in corrections. Crime control is, and will probably remain, the paramount goal, regardless of which model of justice administration do dominates the future. Should increasingly scarce resources be devoted more towards punishment or towards rehabilitation? Well, if we are working under the crime control model, then more resources will be allocated for punishment. That means building new prisons, renovating old institutions, hiring and training more correctional officers, needing to buy more food, more clothing, and more everything else that is needed to house and secure prisoners for a long period of time. That also means that there will be less resources being allocated towards things like educational programs and drug treatment programs. This lack of program resources does not allow for rehabilitation to occur for the inmates who might need those programs. This new style of penology has already emerged and we can see by the mega institutions that are popping up all over the country and by the extended prison sentences that inmates are required to serve under current determinate sentencing structures. Success for this new penology is not measured by reductions in recidivism, but rather by how efficiently correctional systems manage prisoners within budgetary constraints. Most people knowledgeable about corrections in the United States paint a rather bleak picture regarding its future. They believe alternatives to incarceration will not, present, not prevent the need to fund hundreds of costly new jails and prisons, and that the number of citizens under correctional custody will continue to increase. Increasing numbers of offenders will consume increasingly larger proportions of budgets. Governments will resist spending on corrections and will increase reliance on, on alternatives to corrections, privatization, and the use of new technologies. Every attempt will be made to carry out correction functions as, an, as inexpensively as possible. But if we do not start putting money into rehabilitation efforts, then nothing will work to lower the current incarceration rate and we may end up seeing more large-scale releases of low-level, nonviolent drug offenders as we are currently seeing take place at the end of 2015 as a last resort measure to alleviate the overcrowding problems in these institutions. This lecture has shown us what some of the future possibilities look like for the management of the criminal justice system as a whole in the future. Some of these future technologies already exist today. As we see police departments using body and dash cameras, 
traffic cameras, and robot technologies for SWAT purposes. Other areas of the criminal justice system will begin to and will continue to implement new technologies as they become readily available. The issue here is to find the balance between adequate surveillance and going too far on the side of Big Brother. Thank you all for your time, attention, and hard work this semester. I have enjoyed getting to see your work and progress that you have made throughout the course. For those of you who are not criminal justice majors, I hope you enjoyed this exposure to our discipline. For those of you who are criminal justice majors, I look forward to seeing you in the classroom and online again in future courses.